Hello, I'm Deborah Malone, founder of The Internationalist and host of Internationalist Marketing TV. Today's guest is Liz Kneebone, Vice President of the Society and Sustainability Collective. Liz, how wonderful to see you, and I'm sure we're going to have a very interesting conversation. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Deb. I'm excited to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, look, why don't we jump right in? Uh, because I know that sustainability is one of the ANA's priorities. Now, the, sta- the Sustainability Collective, as I understand it, is defined by three pillars. Can you just talk a little bit about what they are? Yeah, absolutely. And and it's interesting because sustainability has been a really inherent part of the ANA for a long time. But a few years ago, um, we redefined it to fall within these three pillars that you mentioned. The first one is focused around society, where we're including inclusive innovation, DEI, and driving growth in a diverse population. The second pillar being planet, all things related to the environment, sustainability, and the growth opportunities presented there. And then our third pillar is around well-being and the role of marketing and building a culture where people feel seen, feel supported. Um, and, and the kind of umbrella and also underpinning of all of that is that all of this comes down to how marketing drives growth. Um, for us, these topics really can't be discussed without bringing into context the ANA growth agenda, um, the different ways that marketing serves a really unique purpose within organizations to connect the dots between different aspects of an organization while also influencing trends, consumer behavior, and culture overall. Um, And so we really bring that planet and society work together to not only use a new lens to identify ways for organizations to innovate by bringing marketing into the fold, um, but also to, you know, look at insights differently, use that as a growth driver, and also benefit the planet and the people that we serve. Well, that sounds like a pretty broad and overwhelming agenda, or at least it does to me. Uh, There's which, always a lot to do. <laughs> which also sounds a lot like um, why marketing has, you know, become so much more complex in mm-hmm. that, you know, it reaches so many of, of these issues. But I, I think that one of the things that you're doing to make this all a little bit more manageable is, is you're also providing a variety of frameworks and resources that help marketers in these areas. Um, but be, before we talk specifically about that, I'm just curious, um, what do marketers tell you? Um, what do they say is their greatest sustainability concern? It's like you said, there's a lot in this universe. And so it is always hard to narrow down to one thing. But I will say in in the context of the last year in particular, where we've seen this kind of pendulum swing away from or towards a kind of sensitivity of language and marketing is a uh, a way that brands are looking to continue to do work related to um, inclusive innovation and sustainability while not playing in the wrong area of that space. So, you know, it's interesting. I think there's a really strong growth opportunity, like I mentioned before, for marketers in particular by bringing this lens to the conversation, but it's also a space where, you know, you have to be careful in the way that you go about doing that work. And so, the way that we address that concern is really by thinking about where there is opportunity to, you know, really just expand your market, meet your consumers where they are, serve the needs of each consumer group, which comes about in different ways. Um, The good news in facing the challenge is that authenticity really does make a difference. Um, And it's, it's funny to always return back to these kind of basic principles of brand building, But, you know, what I mean when I say authenticity is that it's not just about using your voice or purpose in a way that feels authentic, but it's also moving away from, to a degree, a lens of advocacy, per se, to a more growth-oriented approach, um, since that's the core purpose of marketing as a function. Well, that that sounds like a lot of definitions um, <laughs> and a lot of words that that are as what we used to say loaded words. You know, sustainability has a lot of meaning meanings. I, I think that authenticity 
I think we understand what that means from a marketing standpoint, but it 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 gets it gets deeper all the time. Um, let's go from the philosophical and, and the semantic back to a little bit more about some actionable things. And I I know that we talked about frameworks and and resources, and um, I believe that again through the Sustainability Collective and with the CMO Global Growth Council. There's a number of things that you've done with your partners to help bring all of this out, make it make it real. What do you want to start first? Um, and I know we have you didn't mention Planet as much in, in your last answer, but do you want to start first with that report, um, how to achieve mainstream green? Um, because that sounds like that that switching a bit from going from concern about sustainability to adopting sustainable behaviors, which was one of the things that you brought out in terms of, of marketing's purpose. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's important to, like you're saying, frame around the opportunity more often than we frame around the risk. So uh, it's it's lovely to have that kind of tee up. I think to, to give context, one of our primary focuses within the environmental sustainability work we do is the major impact that marketing can have on driving sustainable consumer change um, towards more sustainable purchases, towards you know, how they spend their day to day. Um, and in 2024, that's a particular focus of ours as we think about taking a lens of sustainability to that insights development, product innovation, and unlocking that potential um, that work really kicked off for us with the development of the Mainstream Green Report, which we did in partnership with Sustainable Brands, Adweek, and um, really with strong contributions from Boston Consulting Group, who developed the framework. And here we're really looking into how brands can shape the consumer and customer value proposition, where sustainability should sit within that, and how shifting the perspective influences consumer behavior. So you know, while there's a population that is really actively looking to make sustainable purchases because they are stewards of the environment, the majority of consumers are not fitting into that niche, particularly in the U.S. So what our research shows there is specifically how chief marketing officers in particular can position their value add from a lens that isn't necessarily sustainability focused at first, but does drive sustainable consumer behavior throughout how the product is presented. I wonder, is it is it packaging and is it is it ingredients when it comes to brands? Um, do you have an example? Yeah, it's it's both the packaging and the development of the product, but it's also looking at what core consumer need is being addressed by the product that you're serving to your consumer base. Um, one of the examples that Boston Consulting Group often pulls out is the development of metal straws versus you know, paper straws in the era where we're trying to move away from plastic consumption. Um, the, the tool that has been more productive in driving consumer behavior is the metal straw over the paper straw, not because of its inherent sustainable qualities, but because a metal straw works a lot better than the paper straw. Um, so as marketers and product teams were looking to kind of innovate against sustainability in that context, you can see how those consumer insights kind of drive you in the direction where you're able to serve a benefit of the convenience of the straw, the reusability, while also having a product that actually functions. <laughs> no, I, I, that's a great example. It's a great example because it, it, it also shows, as, as you say, um, not only functionality, but improvement. And I think that's wonderful. Um, I, I, the, the other question is then, how do you start to market that? You know, do you um, do you do you talk about the attributes or or um, I, I think it's wonderful because that does show innovation in action, um, and maybe more of the marketing messages do need to be about that. There there has been some conversation about the green hush where marketers aren't talking enough about the work that they're doing. I, I find it fascinating. Yeah, the the conversation around green hushing, I think, is really interesting and um, obviously fraught, complex in so many ways. But the, the thing that we always come back to is 
rooting your storytelling in your core value proposition and in the data that you have to support it. And I, another one of my favorite examples that falls under the umbrella of Mainstream Green is the work that P&G's Tide brand has done around their cold water campaign. It's both amazing creative and has come from that lens I'm talking about of sustainable innovation where they worked with their suppliers to find an enzyme that washes better in cold water. And then they were able to show consumers how utilizing the product would save them money because they wouldn't need to bring heat into the process of washing their clothes. And, and they're able to keep around that core value proposition rather than heading into those sustainability spaces and have the sustainability as a kind of secondary benefit benefit while still positively impacting the environment. So it's a win-win in that way. No, that, that's a great example. And um, the Internationalist has also collected through our Marketing Makes a World of Difference initiative, examples from around the world. And there's some extraordinary ones when it comes to saving water um, and, and so on. And it, it, it is just, it, it is remarkable what can happen when a corporation's scale and sense of innovation combine to try to do something good like this. So it's great. Um, well, that, that sounds like um, mainstream, achieve mainstream green, it sounds like a wonderful way to get marketers thinking about some of this. Um, now, there's something else that I think that you're doing, um, and it's the ESG brand perception index, is that correct? Um, that's, that's, that's top 20 brands. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so this is our partnership that we have with Swayable and the index really relies on overall consumer opinion within each pillar of ESG to determine rank. Um, so it's really interesting to see how consumer opinions vary from environmental work that a brand is doing to stuff that falls more under the social pillar versus governance. Um, and it's a really competitive landscape at this point. So it's great to have a way to track how that perception changes over time, depending on you know what degree of focus a brand is giving to its ESG efforts, um, what it's doing in communities versus speaking out publicly. And for large brands looking at KPIs when it comes to this work, I think this can be a really great tool to track that progress. How, how many, roughly, how many brands do you track? So it's 20 brands within, I think, 12 different industries. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Hey, you got to begin somewhere, right? Um, and I'm, I'm sure that that enables you to have some benchmarking and, and, so, and you probably can pull out some interesting trends from there. I feel like I'm going through a litany of all the things that, that you're doing, um, but you're also part of another industry initiative called AdNet Zero. Um, I'd, I'd love for you to outline the basics of that. Um, and, and again, most importantly, like, like everything else, how marketers can participate and gain benefits. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that as the world of emissions measurement has evolved, the role of advertising in that conversation has gone unexplored in a lot of ways. The, the reason for that is that for major brands, most of their emissions from advertising fall into a scope three category. So they actually don't have total control over the production of those emissions. It's really difficult to measure when they're produced by partners like agencies, media planners, and buyers and production teams that aren't operating in-house. So the work that AdNet Zero is doing is to create that common methodology so that brands and their partners can be measuring emissions in a way that's comparable from organization to organization. Um, that becomes more and more important as we see regulation coming out of the UK and the EU on multinational brands that are operating in those spaces over a certain size to have to report on these topics. And the really exciting thing about bringing this kind of framework to the fore is that by being intentional with your media supply chain, you also can see a lot of intentionality and improved performance of your ads overall. So where you're having less emissions, you're also performing better with your ad placement, um, which in turn is then lowering costs for marketers overall, which I think is an important part of that conversation. So for, forgive my ignorance, how, how are you describing emissions is it is it the the work that the entire 
agency does and how much of a carbon footprint they're doing with their travel or is it how the media is is activating emissions um just curious yeah you're hitting on exactly why this is a difficult methodology yeah. to develop yes. because the marketing supply chain has so many components that are owned by different organizations um it's it's all of it it's from production it's everything from you know are you reusing a hard drive from one production to the next which formerly was not considered best practice, but there's no reason you shouldn't be able to reuse a hard drive when you're recording over into new creative. Um, it in, it's inclusive of travel. It's inclusive of, you know, the space that you're using. Um, if you're using, you know, AI technologies, the, you know, emissions that come from that technology are included. And then also from the media planning and buying side, things like when the ad runs, how much carbon is produced. So, you know, the fewer times your ad runs and the more views it gets, you're reducing emissions relative to those views and improving performance. Wow. Wow. Um, I, 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 and I don't, don't take this the wrong way, but there was a time where people thought that, you know, the, the business of advertising was all about people and there was a lot of hot air involved. Um, forgive the uh, <laughs> double entendre <laughs> there. Um, but um, no, it's interesting because um, I recall in uh, one of our awards, um, it was actually um, for McDonald's in Germany. They used outdoor billboards that were sustainable in that they the billboards themselves were created from wood that became recycled. And they also used a paint that apparently brought more car, uh, more oxygen, not, took carbon out of the air and put more oxygen or whatever. And um, it's extraordinary, some, some of the things that can be done when, when you think about it, which was, you know, we awarded it because it was an example of like literally sustainable outdoor, outdoor media. And there's, Germany has been great on some of this. And there's, there was also someone that did an outdoor board out of plants. Now it, it did happen to be a, a a a DUI store and and you know you know and, and so on, but it's it, it's fascinating again back to innovation and so on and, and what it can do. Um, you started by saying that that growth is your mandate, and um, I'm wondering if you can talk about what you've seen in terms of how sustainability is driving growth. And I, and I know this can be a bit of a tricky question because some sustainability models now are certainly about less consumption, being part of the circular economy, and traditionally marketers' role was, sadly, you know, a, a reality, get people to buy more, right? That was one of the indicators of growth. So I, I'd love to hear how, how you're seeing that change. Yeah, I, I'm glad you bring that up because I think that where marketing sits in our future regenerative economy is is one that should be the focus of what we're talking about right now, especially as we think about, you know, where your market exists five, 10 years from now. Um, but, you know, I think actually one example of that is the Tide example that I mentioned before, where, you know, they have taken this marketing led product innovation and increased their market share year over year for the last five years um, through the development of this product and the subsequent marketing campaigns. Um, a another example I love comes from um, Haleon and their Advil brand. And I think that's a good example because it's not a product you can reuse, it's a consumable. Um, and so one of the things that they've had to think about is bringing their sustainability and marketing teams together to think about how delivery of their consumable product can be more efficient. And so what they've done is in, I think 2021 or 2022, they set a goal to reduce the amount of plastic in the Advil bottle by up to 70%. Um, and when the marketing team became aware of this initiative from the sustainability team, 
they put together this effort um, and turned it into a campaign with their retail partners like Walmart and Target to do everything from in-store displays to a redo of their digital experience. Um, they had some amazing earned media attention from that work and also saw really impactful results in terms of growth, including sales lift. They also gained market share and especially exciting for them in this context was that they attracted a lot of new younger consumers to the franchise. And I think that as Gen Z and eventually Gen Alpha gain more buying power, we're going to continue to see more consumer demand in this regard. So um, a good thing to start thinking about and dig into now. Yeah, no, no, it's a, it's a very good example. Um, now, if they want to be, you know, 100% sustainable, they just have to go back to the old ways of having pharmacists refill glass bottles, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, uh, some, um, but um, you, know, you you make some great points. And I, I, I think you're right about the, the Tide example. P&G has always been really wonderful about expanding into new areas where um, they're not taking share, they're making share. So I think that that's a, that is a wonderful example. Now, are, are there any other uh, resources, frameworks, tools, for marketers that you you would also like to bring up now or or talk about as part of your work yeah, the the example I just mentioned from Advil is actually a part of one of our most impactful resources on sustainability and DEI. Um, it's from our 2023 CMO's Guide to Sustainable and Inclusive Innovation, which is a collection of case studies from medium-sized and large brands, including um, Cascade, another P&G brand, Ab Advil, obviously, um, EOS, HP Graphic Arts, Abbott, and a few others um, that really show what the opportunities for growth that we're talking about here look like in practice. Um, I, I like to recommend this to folks that are both beginning their journey of either working with their counterparts in the C-suite and encountering pushback as to why representation is important or why they should be thinking about their emissions and environmental impact from a marketing perspective, but also for those that are already doing the work, um, because I think there are some great examples of just how to structure your thinking, how to try new strategies based on the cases that are involved. There's so much growth potential. And like you mentioned, many of these cases actually don't just grow market share for one brand, they grow the entire category. So I really think that our industry is just getting started in this regard. No, that that's that might be the the most optimistic news I heard all week. Um, but um, no, I you you make a very good point, and I I think that you know marketers you know love storytelling, um, but I also think they learn most from from case studies and from examples. And the great thing about that is is not all of the examples that you mention are are straight out just sustainability examples. They're talking about you know innovation and and new products and new ways of of helping consumers lives and they just happen to have a natural overlay of of being sustainable at the same time and that might be the next evolution of marketing as we see it it will just begin to be incorporated and wouldn't wouldn't that be wonderful but it also sounds like um marketing does need to work with a lot of the product teams or if there is a sustainability officer or or something is, is that right yeah i think collaboration and and partnership whether it's internal or external is a really critical part of the conversation um you know, we live in community, whether we do that as individuals, as employees, or honestly, as brands. And so I think the more you can encourage collaboration with other departments, the better. I think marketing is best positioned to do that because of the way that they're kind of the keeper of the keys on cultural insights, on, you know, where the market is going overall. Um, and when you get those stories from a sustainability team or even often from your financial counterparts, you can kind of bring that into the minds of consumers in a way that wouldn't otherwise happen. Um, and so it doesn't have to be an only marketing led initiative. Oftentimes, it's just kind of that collaboration that that brings that out. No, no, you bring up a good point. And you also bring up a good point about why marketing makes a lot of sense to, to be involved. Well, 
I, I get the feeling that you are definitely an idealist at heart. Um, so I, I have a kind of a personal, uh, personal business question for you. Um, what would you like to see happen in the world to ensure that sustainability is treated with the seriousness that it deserves? Probably more than one thing, but I, I am a strong believer in especially our current cultural and political context that business can change our culture for the better. Um, one of the things that's difficult when it comes to sustainability and marketing is that this work takes time. Um, sometimes it requires restructuring teams. It requires new metrics um, and, and results benchmarks to really define impact and success. Um, but I, I think that marketing in general, you know, if you take a more long-term view, and that doesn't have to be years, that can just be, you know, multiple quarters, um, you can see the long-term view in a way where if it's sustainability related or not, you can see the impact that it has in the long-term. Um, and so I think just adding that lens to the conversation is a really helpful thing. We're in a world where brands are building relationships, not just transactions. Um, and I think that if we can continue to shift towards that view of how we're building our brands, um, looking at growth, consumer loyalty, um, and honestly, the whole marketing playbook will see sustainability rise to the top as a value add for brands themselves. Yeah, I think their their um, the storytelling will help with new ways to talk about it as opposed to have it in a silo, like, oh my gosh, I have to talk about how I can be green. I, I think you're you're right with some of the examples that you bring out, just how the evolution of this. Um, I, I love the fact that you you talk about it might the longer term view might be multiple quarters. Um, is, is there a sense of urgency around this? It seems like there is in Europe because of the EU regulations on on some of these issues, whether it's 2030 or whatever it is. It doesn't feel like there's the same urgency in the US or perhaps other parts of the world. Although, you know, after the latest uh, COP meeting, um, you know, in uh, in the Middle East, I mean, it certainly seems like the Middle East is is surging ahead with this too. Yeah, I think cultural urgency versus what the actual business requires is something that we don't always align in the US. Um, I think that urgency is there and not everyone is picking up on it at this point. I, you know, I'm having a lot of conversations with folks where we're thinking about, okay, where, where digital was a number of years ago is where sustainability is now. And there are so many brands that are, you know, ruining the day that they didn't invest more heavily in that when it was a more nascent part of the playbook. Um, we're, we're well into that moment with sustainability. That urgency is here. Um, and I think that just the way that we have structured the, the function in the U.S. is evolving in a way that we'll see a lot of, you know, increased momentum on this year and in coming years. Yeah, and I, I also think um, often global brands have the advantage in that they work across so many countries and we forget the kind of regulation that that means. And there's always great examples that one can take from one place and, and, bring, and bring to another. Well, finally, although I have a feeling we could talk about this all day, um, finally, what's, what's next for the sustainability, sustainability collective in 2024? A, a lot of things as as we've kind of continued to emphasize, but you know, I'm, I mentioned this before, we're really heavily focused this year on driving sustainable consumer behavior change, of course, in a way that drives growth. So this year, as we see some of the methodology results from ad net zero and build new measurements for advertising when it comes to things like sustainable behavior, we'll work on sharing this with the industry in a way that includes strategy to bring this focus into organizations that we work with and those that we don't. Um, and I think, you know, folks that are interested in taking part in shaping the work, I would encourage to join us through our committees at the ANA um, and at the CMO level, the Global Growth Council, where we're really setting the industry agenda for the work. Um, there is a lot to do, um, but I feel really lucky to be a part of a, a tremendous community of leaders that are guiding the way for it. 
No, you, well said. And um, I love how you believe that, that business can be a major factor in uh, driving positive change. I, I'm a big, a big believer in that too. Well, I hope you'll come back and fill us in on, on not only um, more of the initiatives, but more of the examples and, and stories of innovation and, and case studies. They're, they're always so inspiring. Liz, thank you so much for the work that you do. And it was a pleasure to talk to you. The Internationalist focuses on the continual reinvention of marketing by highlighting inspirational marketers around the world and their ideas as they move the industry forward. Internationalist Marketing TV shares these perspectives through interviews and personal stories. Thanks so much for watching. If you find this kind of content helpful, please click like or subscribe. Again, thanks so much.